well, it's officially afternoon, so good afternoon and welcome everybody to the top of exhibition series of the Magnus. Every week, fall and spring semesters, we uh, put together uh, speakers, presenters from campus and the community, scholars uh, of various disciplines with objects from the Magnus collection. And we essentially see what happens. So it's every time an experiment. And sometimes presenters talk specifically about the objects. Other times they use them as exhibitions. They're often used as props or other types of conversation. But today's presenter is Rabbi Yoel Khan, a dear friend, a, a wonderful voice in our community, and a fantastic scholar. I'm happily holding his book, The Three Blessings, by, uh, published by Oxford University Press. And uh, I have to say also, a fellow liturgist, we, we share a passion for Jewish liturgy, and I can, I can swear it's a very small club, so we're <laughs> all very, very close together, and there's a lot of affection there. So it was sort of like a, a natural uh, relationship to, to foster with today's presentation by asking Yoel to come and play, as he did, on his, on his days off. He's rare the days off, come and play with the rare books in the Magnus Collection. Many of these books were collected in, uh, in uh, very interesting ways. Some of the rarest books were actually brought, were printed in Europe, were actually brought to Berkeley from India. So they were part of the collection of, it, of the Jewish community in Kerala, India. Others were part of other small community collections around the world. Uh, so each of these volumes has its own history and it's a, it's a very interesting one. But also these books have content and have texts. And this is how you are uh, framing his uh, presentation today. So please join me in welcoming Yoel Khan uh, to uh, the stage for his presentation, as you can see, on external and internal censorship in Jewish prayer, prayer books and liturgy. Welcome, Yoel. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, thank you all for uh, being here, and especially thank my faithful friends who uh, came today, especially to be here. Thank you. Uh, all of you are here. Um, we're going to talk today specifically about one particular locus um, uh, of Jewish um, of Jewish books. Let's talk a little bit about the history of books and printing a little bit. Um, the big turning point for books is Gutenberg, and Gutenberg is about 1450, 60, whatever. The first Hebrew book is 14. Soon thereafter, the first prayer book, that's what of course we care about, um, uh, is printed in Italy in 1482, I want to say, 92, those two dates. I'll be there on the right decade, more or less. But when you have before the printed book, how do you produce books before Gutenberg? You handwrite and you copy them. So it's kind of dissemination. So a bestseller, let me tell you, a bestseller is if we have 50 or 100 copies of a manuscript that survived for the last 600 or 700 years, it's a bestseller. And so therefore, to have a book was a very big deal. Having a library of 10 books or 20 books, that was incredible. Which is part of the reason, by the way, when you read older Jewish books, there's so much copying of text. Right? They have these long quotations. In part because you can't assume that the person that has the older, the older book, who it says Rabbi so and so said in his commentary, we have to go, no, that you can't assume the person that had that book in front of them, we trust the transmission. But also that I want to control what's in the book. It's relatively easy to send somebody around and to inspect what's right there. And so, oh, I'm sorry, Frank Florence, I'm not sorry, I want to tear that age out of your notebook. And that's the reason we don't have to worry, it's not going anyplace else. Once we move to the printing press, control over printing becomes a bigger deal. I've got to tell you, some other terrible things are happening in the world in the same century. Um, again, I'm not so great on dates, but um, this guy, this upstart clergy person in, uh, in Germany, um, uh, walks up to um, uh, um, the church door and, handwritten no doubt, but nails 96 or uh, 90 something. Um, uh, thesis on the church door. Around what year is Martin Luther doing this? 15, 15, 16. You know, things are troubling time. So they're concerned about what people are saying. Well, for Christianity in the Christian world, um, the Jews are always a problem. Because, you know, they did their thing, and the law came JC, and why do these stubborn people keep sticking around? 
And so it's a what's sort of what, and so we kind of tolerate them to greater and lesser degrees over time. But one important thing is that we're going to let them. They shouldn't build their buildings too high. Um, those you saw the New York Times magazine this week, there was in the travel magazine, there was a piece about the, uh, the ghetto and the synagogues where the buildings shouldn't look too much like the synagogue. Those of you with me on our architecture tour of San Francisco last year, we saw the same thing there as well in the Mission Synagogue on 19th Street, which is sort of just meant to blend in, not draw attention uh, to itself. So what you should do, and also, there was what you should say, you shouldn't say nasty things about Christians. Very important. So, Jews, though, always a minority. Um, I had in their historical liturgy three blessings that I'm looking for the pointer. It's in my pocket. No. Under the podium. Thank you so much. Um, three things, and this is an historical liturgy that we have already from the Talmud, um, uh, that you shouldn't say. You shouldn't wake up every morning and say, thank God, I'm not a boy. I'm not a Gentile. And you thank God and say, I'm not a slave. And the last one we are going to talk about today is it's so embarrassing. <laughs> and I love those of you who are Shars the Hall break, uh, Bethel members, rather, um, Bethel regulars who note that we have this in our prayer book instead of the cleaned up version. Ours, it's the diamond, the circle, and the star. So this is the text that we start with. And this was sort of started for me as a question about 30, 25 years ago. Um, I was doing a talk for the ritual committee of my synagogue, and, they, and I was going to be teaching. And I was looking at the blessings, the morning blessings, and I said, where do these come from? Where do these come from? And I was going to research, I didn't know the answer. And so, that is how my book, and my PhD in my book came out, I was trying to answer where these came from. Well, we're not entirely sure where they came from, but one hint is that, let's just imagine that we are in the first or second century of common era. And where do people hang out together? Where's like a shared cultural space? Okay. I want to say, in our culture, the most mixed cultural space you have is the stadium. Right? Go to a basketball or another sports event, compare that to the symphony or the movies or any other places that, that we hang out. The most, and so I have this fantasy, I could be wrong, I have this fantasy that people met in the Roman bathhouse. And, you know, they're sort of doing this thing, the one liners. And so there's this famous line that the Ajides, who's an early um, uh, Greek teacher, you know, sort of had this famous line in which he said that he was very grateful that he was born a human being and not a brute, not a non speaking dumb animal. Sorry, I have to say, it was, it was the Greeks who said it, not us. Uh, born a man and not a woman, and lastly, being a Greek superior person, born a Greek and not a barbarian. Bar 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 which is anything that's not Greek. It's just that you had to head, it's unclear whether in this period Hebrew, the word goy meant either a Gentile or specifically meant Greek in response. And then we have another one, um, uh, same kind of concept, that Pluto, that Plato would say that he was grateful, he was born human, and again, not an animal, not a beast. We're not sure of the translation issue here. Greek and not a barbarian, and then this one, yeah, that time frame as well. This expression of this and not this, this and not this, come together. Now, a little hard to see, but what do we know of Jewish terrorists from this time? This is a, a text from the Geniza. Now, Geniza texts are from probably the 9th or 10th century. So we're about a thousand years already later, but still an older form, preserving older forms of prayer from the Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And I'm just going to go to the next slide because things are a little small and easier to see. Oops, no, it's not. All right, let's look at this one then. So, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Barata Oti, Borei Priyagafen, who made me Adam Velo Behema. Florence? Behema's what? A monster. A beast. In Yiddish, a behemoth is, you know, is your 12-year-old out of control, right? <laughs> right? And there's some kid got sued for violating the, uh, the Yale University um, student code for yelling at his window, and a group of girls stopped it, stepping such behemoths. Um, a yeshiva booker. Behemoth is a, is a cow, a beast of some kind. Adam, a behemoth? Adam, Adam, a person, not a beast. Uh, 
ish velo isha. Male and not female. Yisrael velo goy. Mal velo arel. Very interestingly, one who circumcises or circumcised and not uncircumcised. Clearly not born that way, but somehow the one was in this group. And lastly, Hoshi velo evan. Free and not a slave. So here we have Jews clearly saying the same thing as the Greeks were saying back and forth. And I have this idea that the Greeks said, well, let me tell you this good one, this is what I heard, blah, 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 blah. And the Jew on the next page says, yeah, well, let me tell you back what I think about that. <laughs> and here's another one, just, another, just, just to show you what these texts look like. One of the fun things about doing this kind of work is when you read these old Hebrew texts. Okay? This one's a little nicer, you will see. It's also a, 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 from a book. And the other thing is that because it was in the Geniza, which was the storeroom, we don't have the whole book. We just have the random page. A lot of these random pages, so don't the whole rest. But this is clearly a much nicer production to number here. And here we'll see again the exact same thing, all really quick. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam ashevarati adam velo behema ish velo isha Yisrael velo goi mal velo arel koshi velo evan. And I just brought down here a blessing we don't see anymore, but I'm very fond of. Blessing we praise Adonai melech ha'olam ashevarati who created adam harishon v'dibuto v'tzolmo. We praise the one who created the first person in God's image and likeness. Um, it's not a blessing that we currently have anywhere in our liturgy anymore. It's not a beautiful text um, uh, that uh, we, we cover sometimes by looking at some of these things. I'm just sort of playing with this about it. Um, the answers, or the, the, the further proof text, my understanding, my idea that there was this shared cultural space in which the Romans were, or the, the Romans were saying one thing, still quoting Greeks, but now we're Romans, and the Jews are something else, was that in the New Testament, we have the same oppositions. And so Jesus, uh, Paul actually says um, uh, about Christ, as many of God, when you come to church, it's a great marketing. Right? This one says 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 this There is not slave nor free. There's not male nor female. And many people tried to understand the origins of this particular phrase, and my hypothesis is that they were all shared, had a common cultural knowledge that they were then borrowing from that allowed them to do it. So that's the background of what where we started with. Um, this is um, now another Gnesa text that I just want to look at for a moment. Again, these Gnesa texts are in Egypt, showing most showing a variety of places. Jews moved around a lot, you know. Um, and this text is probably from the somewhere between the 10th and the 12th century, I'm going to guess. We don't know for sure. Um, and again, it only has the one page. And it's not very big. It's about, you know, four inches by five by six inches. It's a very small thing, and you can see that it was folded over here. Okay. Um, over here, I just want to look up here. You can see the, the torn in the corner. But we have it abbreviations. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohim Melech HaOlam. Paper was expensive, right? It was took a long time. Okay. Shalom Samtani Goy didn't make me a boy. Shalom Samtani Evan didn't make me a slave. Shalom Samtani Isha didn't make me a woman. Notice we don't have the back and forth. We just have the one. That's all negative. And then here we have Shalom Samtani Behema didn't make me a Behema. But what happened to it? And over here, it's Shalom Samtani Lugumot HaAlam Elame Amcha Yisrael, who didn't make me of the nations of the world or out of your people Israel. Now, take a look at this and tell me the stages of what happened here. It just, yes, but just what happened to the text? What happened on this page? What's the, the physical history of this page? Pardon? Okay, so who did the crossing out? Who did the crossing out? All right, we don't know, but look carefully. You'll see there are no vowels here, and there are vowels up here. This has black ink. This has brown ink. Was it the next day or the next century? We have no historical record of the fragment. But at some point in time, an older Palestinian, Eretz Yisrael style, which had more creativity and what you could say 
was made to line up with the first three which were dominant from Babylonia. And the person who added the vowels went to school in Babylonia. And therefore came in and added the vowels and got here and said, this one we don't say, I'm going to cross it out. This one, well, I'm not so sure about. Can we wait and take this discuss whether we feel about that? And therefore, here we have, a thousand years later, this thing circled for, circled for consideration. Right? I would not being fully discussed. And so I just love this page um, I very much. You can see down here, by the way, um, uh, there's another place where he corrected the text here um, a little bit to make it go fit a little better. Oh, here's the same thing we just talked about. I don't know if I'm for it. We'll go past that one. Um, it looks very hard to see, but it has an adorable little graphic at the bottom. Um, uh, but you can see sort of, this is a... Um, a, a, a picture of a page. This was a picture. This is a, a capture of a um, uh, of a microfilm in which the, the ink itself is being more corrupted by the slightly smaller one here. And we'll see it's, I'm just, it's really hard to tell from there. But if we're looking hard, I'll tell you. But here it says, I can see here, Shalom Santani Ebed in purple. Didn't make me a slave. Didn't make me circumcised, but not uncircumcised. I'm going to guess what's in here. You can't really see yourself as the right passage for today because we can't really tell. Um, so, here come the Jews. So, the church has this issue. And the church decides that the word goy in Hebrew means Christian. And therefore, Jews shouldn't say anything about Christians. In fact, Jews shouldn't say the word goy, period. And they have, in the early period, a very analog idea about censorship. And therefore, they go looking for individual words. And as long as you erase the word, it's okay. So, here we can see, here we can see, Aleinu l'shaveh l'adon hachol l'atet g'dula l'yotzer b'reshi shalom asano I'm sorry, we're not saying that anymore. <laughs> On the one hand, we look at this and just feel the um, the violence being done here. And the alternative was having your book burned. And you have to imagine, this was a, a, a like one of these, a big folio-sized book for us, earlier to use. We don't know what they actually said in the synagogue, but right, we, can't, we don't want to confuse the text. But in this case, we have a manuscript, we just went through and x out with our, our manuscript page. Redacted. I hear it's a little bigger, just so you can see it. A little nice. Now, this is just want to say one of the reasons I like this. You have to look at these beautiful books. And the hand, this is a gorgeous hand. The best thing about this hand is gorgeous and it's legible. I love it. There are many books that we look at, as Francesca will affirm, in which they are neither gorgeous nor legible. And we've spent many great deals trying to figure out what the, what the script is. And there are a couple more. Um, uh, oh. Um, um, up here, this is the end of the Alayu. Shalosam Khalkenu Kahem, Vagoralenu Kahol Hamonam. Because God did not make our portion like them, but our portion or our portion like that of all of the other groups. Shahayu, that they would, see what it's erased? They would bow down to emptiness and vanity to a Savior who does not save. But we bow down to the one, the Holy One, uh, the King of Kings, etc., etc., and don't you forget it. Well, the Oxy didn't like that. And so that was one of the places. Um, uh, there are a few other things on this page we'll just skip right past for now. Um, uh, here we can see the same thing a little more clearly. I'm sorry, I forgot I have these two of these. Let me do these. Chalkenu kahem v'gora leinu kachol hamonam shehayu they would me bow down. Um, uh, they put it in the past tense. They used to bow down, trying to make it a little nicer, but still not quite clean enough. It's still kind of legible under the margin, yes. though. So any any Jew who knows his or her stuff can still see it. And Everyone know, and we know what it says. Everyone knows what it says here, but for the purposes of cleanup, of not, I would not have to look at it anymore quite so much. 
Now, here's what I just want to, just want to see. We're still here looking at manuscripts. These manuscripts are from, you know, it takes the printing press a while, right? The same way, just think about for our grandparents and great-grandparents, there was a good 50 years where the, the horse and the electric motor were overlapping, depending on whatever else, and the technologies caught up with each other. So I just want to see, this is a hand manuscript page. This is a beautiful page. Here's how nicely it's laid out. And look at what happens to the censorship here. Same spot. They went down to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we bow down to the Holy One. So what happened here? What's different with this one? Scraped it off. Do you think that was a Jewish or non-Jewish censor did that? Right. Compare the treatment, the respect for this book versus the one who came with the brush and just went swooping through. So in this case, we have internal Jewish cleaning up of the book to go present it to the person, get approval, and then they can take it home again. Were these, were these just manuscripts that the rabbis led from and the congregation just didn't have them? Or did they have them? Highly unlikely that the individual would do the few, especially something like this, which is just because this belonged to a synagogue, most likely. It was too, you know, um, uh, it was like collecting books was like collecting art. Mm -hmm. So I might have one, but if I had one, it was much more like the one that was on the cover here, that was a much more handwritten, you know, sort of lower production value, it's easier to have kind of thing. Um, uh, it was a matter of prestige and money, or, you know, often like, like today, people would endow one. In honor of your children's wedding, I'm now going to give a special, very nice a commission a copy, and everyone will know if it was my gift, and it's my, that kind of thing. Where, where was that from? Um, I have to go look, but these are overwhelmingly Italian prayer books in the 15th century. Um, this one I just want to show you. Um, uh, um, this is an early printed book. Um, you can sort of see, look at the all of the dot the bottom of the moon. These were elements clearly that were put inside there. <coughs> this is a dome, this is the beginning of a dome along, I think. Yes. You can see the rest of the log here. And I want to see what the page looks like. And then I want to focus in on <coughs> it was printed. Shalom Asani Goy, who didn't make me a Gentile. And then to look in through and very lightly exit out. Post publication censorship. Um, this is a um, a manuscript by the by someone we know, his name is Abraham Ferreira. He lived in um, uh, he was around uh, Ferreira, Mantua, um, uh, those places, um, uh, Parma, between about 1480 and 1520 or so. Um, and we have about 10 of his prayer books um, uh, that we that have this text in front of us. And when you see, how we can recognize he has this beautiful, beautiful handwriting, beautifully laid out pages. And then in the margin here, you can see didn't make didn't make me a man made me a man and not a beast. Circumcised not uncircumcised. Made me Yisrael, an Israelite, and not clearly got a race, because we have the four in a row, one, two, three in a row. Clearly there was more where you can see it. And what's it over here? Can you figure it out? The signature of the person wrote. Markion. M A R I O N and a little do ticky over here on the side. Oh, was the first. Slides also have a signature on it. Yes, I'm having a previous one. Um, uh, he was a professional censor, and he got paid a nickel a word. And therefore, when he got to this spot, he wants to say, "I was here. I caught. I took care of this one. I approved this page. Don't you try and take credit uh, uh, for it." Was he Jewish? Jewish? No, Markion. Mark Yon, it's really my brother, my brother Mordechai. 
but he just kind of wanted to get a scholarship that people could convert, and so he did. Yeah. Okay, don't tell, don't tell anybody, okay? Yeah. So ex-Jews, conversos. Many, don't say conversos. Okay. Ex-Jews who became, you know, it's like the guy who was the, uh, the Archbishop of Paris until recently. Uh, right? People who were born Jewish, who were converted, and was, who knows Hebrew? Yeah. Who can read this stuff? And also, like, do you really trust these guys to, like, really, like, you know, do stuff? What's the job you do is sort of love them to take care of. And I have to say, if you have some issues with your family, go come into authority and, uh, you know, go, go, you know, take over a little bit. There's some power issues being expressed here, too. Okay. Um, what are we looking at here? Oh. Oops, sorry, we'll go back to this one quickly. Uh, didn't make me a woman. Didn't make me a slave. <laughs> Was there ever anything there? We can't really tell. You know, I haven't put it under, um, you know, the right, what do you call it? Um, Infrared to look exactly, I suspect the member was anything there. But this is a last some little illustrations we've lost or whatever else. This person didn't waste space. So it's another insider hint to those who know will get that there's something there. So look how right, so remember on the first one we saw there was that ink mark across the page. Here we have Pre-set, pre-anticipatory censorship. I don't want you to mess up my beautiful artwork. I don't want to mess up my beautiful page. So I'm just going to live. It's like in, in sculpture. We have a negative space here, in which we have to understand what is supposed to be in the space. It's never written down in the first place. Correct. That's what we think here. All right. So now let's just zoom along. Let's some, so now let's put some. I want to run out of time for our time. Some creative Jewish responses. Here's just a lovely little prayer book here. And what do we do instead? Yehudi made me a Jew. Positive alternative. One possibility. Um, I'm just going to show you on the page how the page looks here, and then we're over here. Isha, woman, Evan. And what's this last word? Hebrew speakers? Arami. Arami. What's an Arami? An Aramean. Are there any Arameans living in 15th century Europe, do you think? Okay. There are Arameans in the book of Genesis, though. So, we know who we mean, but we aren't saying it. All right? Little you, that's not on the approved list. So no, no. Okay. This one, I just want you to see. This one is. We ran out of room here. It was really so it had to like go up the side a tiny bit. And uh, I got. Let's turn it sideways. So this one, the second one, just this whole room for the red one over here. It's a little hard to see. Yishma Eli. Who's a Yishma Eli? Ishmaelites. Are there any Ishmaelites in 15th century? Well, there might be one on the boat, you know. We might trade with them. But I make them. You know, right now, uh, Jews today want to say, we are Europe, and they don't want to we are European. Against whom? Against Islam. As opposed to an older Jewish Christian narrative, which is the Jews versus, I mean, with the Christians, versus those Muslims and Jews. All right, so this is an old Jewish sort of trope here. I'm going to put it along here if I can. Um, I just like this one because it has the hand down there. It's just, it's cute. Um, and we'll skip that. Is that an extra drawing? Yeah, it's just filling the space. No, I'm just filling the space. I'm just having fun. All right, we're going to zoom along here for a couple quickly. Um, uh, uh, a little hard to see. But um, she didn't make me cross out the word boy and inserted behema in its place. Right? And I'm just going to skip past the next one so we can go to our our magnets exhibits here. Those lovely little more things here. Here's our marketing guy again. And, okay. So let's talk about the first of our two books. 
Um, uh, it is a, um, a prayer book printed in Venice in 1568. Um, it's the one that is on the right in our case. Um, I just want to see that it was a very fancy production. It's got these metal studs around the corners. Um, these were clasps to keep it clasped shut. You can see there's some embossing on the leather. It's leather bindings. It's lost most of its um, spine winding. If you get a chance to look at it over there, you can sort of see here is the strings where the signatures were tied together. So um, uh, we have it. And um, this was a printed prayer book. Um, printed in Venice, which had a very large um, production for Ashkenazic Jews. And here's the title page. Halak Rishon Machzor Mechol Shnat Nechlo Kadosh Ashkenaz. First part of the prayer book for the entire year. The word Sidor and Machzor are used interchangeably um, uh, for um, all the communities of Ashkenaz. And then, um, you know, some nice little rhyme, little couple about how good it is, on and on. And then we're going to look at some of the, um, the printing instructions here. Rachel Weiss has loved this. Um, Francesco, do you get us to tell us what the, uh, um, the, the, the slope of the, um, the statement is? Tardi said to it, But the works. But, but, but all of it. All right, so it's all this. Uh, you know, slow comes as page for information, but worth that. Okay. Just the Latin inscription. All right. This is not exactly being marked. This is not the one that was produced for the Hebrew market, let's just say. All right. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then at the bottom, we have the copyright information with Venezia there at the bottom. And I just broke this up because it was so interesting to look at. Um, printed in the house of Mr. Giorgio de Cavalli in the year 5,328 which was therefore equal to 28th day of the month of Tevet in 1568. Notice. Actually, if you spell Kavali with a C, it's, a, it's an actually common last name. Oh, actually, thank you. Yeah. I was transliterating. OK. And the second part of the second. Bechorish harishon l'shevet adoneinu hadukas pyro lordom yarum hodo po ba'ir venizia. In the first month of the reign of our Lord, the Doge Pietro Leodoni, may his glory be exalted here in the city of Venice. Our Doge Pietro Leodoni. <laughs> and it turns out I did check in that, as we like to say on Christian's Wikipedia, and indeed, this, the Times all lined up uh, uh, correctly. And for those of you who care about other issues about ours today, this is a Tintoretto. So, this is the page we are open to on our prayer book. And what does it say? Shasani Yisrael. Pre publicate, pre by the printer decision to print something that we can get away with and not have to worry about or we have permission to say. Our second book is a quite different um, animal. It's the one that is on the left in our window. Um, uh, it is printed. Well, first of all, as well, you see, we have uh, Moses and Aaron and a few biblical scenes. Um, this particular, um, what do we call this thing? Um, uh, front piece, front piece is used over and over again. And many editions of this particular book and many other books as well. Uh, this one sort of got around. And you just had to change the middle part. And so let's take a look at that. Um, uh, also, Sidur Hamachzor. Halak Rishon, Minhag Kaminat Ashkenazim, a prayer book um, uh, with the um, uh, in the Ashkenazim cust cust um, customs, everything edited in order with all the prayers, give praise to God, who are wonders, new and beautiful letters, white paper with nice ink, <laughs> and a careful commentary, one of my favorite of the many. This is, oh, by the way, this is a rhyme, too, this being the fifth edition. And then what do we have down here? Licensed by his most revered lordship, the elector of Palatine and Duke of Sulzbach. Um, Sulzbach uh, is a town in uh, Lower Bavaria, and um, at some point, some you know these princes were always dividing and rearranging their properties. Um, and uh, they, we know it's after 1742 because that's when they got the two titles got combined. Um, and I haven't figured out exactly when the fifth edition came out. Um, here's this nice 
big page you'll see, it looks like a commentary kind of curve of the commentary. And now let's just look down here. Shalom uh, Aslani Kuti. That's a kuti. I didn't get, not get kutis from these people. They didn't make me a kuthite. A kuthite is very understood as a Samaritan, although rabbinically, but the kuthites were against one of these bizarre, unheard of groups, walking groups in the book of Genesis. As I've heard it before. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> so here's another example of already. We are in, I said seven, not, not before 1743, right? well into the 18th century, in order to get permission or get away with printing our prayer book, we still can't say anything not nice. And furthermore, just in case we missed it, on the title, after the, um, uh, after the title page, the next page, there's this long dedicatory preface, at this part, this important announcement. I just, I've never seen this before, so I'm going to read it. To every reader and prayer out of this prayer book, every place where we see the word Goyim, or Akum, which is an abbreviation for worshiper of stars and planets, or Oved Abadazawa, worshiper of idols, all these are references to ancient peoples who worship stars and planets, and none believed at all in the religion of the Creator, may be less or in providence, as is recalled by the Rambam, a blessed memory of his book, The Mission of the Torah, The Laws of Idolatry, and in his guide, The Guide to Perplexed, Part 3, Chapters 29 and 30. Maimonides calls them the sect of the Nabataeans, and this in no manner relates to the peoples of the present day. Wow. On the contrary, about them that are saved to say, pray for the shalom of the government. And furthermore, that their custom each day we pray for the shalom of the government. And may the God of shalom bless this people with shalom too. Okay, written in Hebrew. But at the front of the prayer book, as a defense, lest someone think nasty things about us. Um, we're not going to trace the rest of this, but the language that we have today starts in about the 1940s or so in the conservative prayer book, where for the first time you get all three blessings changed from negative to positive, where you get made me a Jew, made me free, made me in the divine image. However, if you starting in the last 20 years in American Orthodox prayer books, for example, Art Scroll, you will find they will bring back the original language, including who didn't make me a goy, and putting back the original language in a language with a more assertive Jewish nationalism um, as well. So um, I love these particular um, uh, books uh, so much. Um, there's one more in here which we talked about today, just has Shalom Shasani PD, made me a Jew, um, because I feel like it captures, connects us today to what was being done a while back or even further, and things like this give us a window or a little bit of insight into the politics of the marginalized Jewish community and which we're saying one thing here or over here, but what are we saying over here? What's for public consumption? What's for private consumption? And um, uh, um, how we can sort of trace a text that in its origin, I think, was entirely, was really like a team slogan to a liturgical text, to a place of battle, ideological battleground um, in liturgy, and then um, is still in use in our communities today. Thank you very much. Eisenhower America, let's just say, 
we get, we, we cultivate the mythology that we have Jews and we have Catholics and Protestants and Jews, right? Go to Kennedy Airport and there are three chapels, right? You go to the West Point, there are three chapels, right? You go to these, and these are like the things that are, those are good to, as, you know, Eisenhower, I read what he said when I was alleged to have said, it doesn't matter where you go to church as so long as you go somewhere, so you have to be something. Those are the acceptable somethings. And if we're anybody else was out there. And so the pagan is anybody, is, is again, anybody else. We are somewhat still at that, right? Um, uh, you know, it takes a long time for, um, you know, for the uh, popular religion of Haiti, for example, to be equally respected among those other three, right? There's no chapel of Kennedy Airport even to this day, even though probably more Haitians would be inclined to fly through it than perhaps some of the other groups. Please. The censors who erased or scraped some of the words, how do you explain their sensitivity to why why did they burn the book rather than going uh, page by page? Do you have a book? You have a book, sir? Indeed. Yeah, um, uh, I have an order here um, uh, to seize um, uh, all of the books on this shelf. Um, for, of course, if you would like to have a sidebar conversation with me and perhaps pay a printing tax to subsidize my edition of this important book that I'm going to print on behalf of the governor or on behalf of the church, you wouldn't want, I can arrange to overlook your collection today. So the, they're all, so it, go, it depends on, we vary from locality to locality. We're kind of across centuries, um, uh, but usually, often, there was a bribe involved of some kind or a tax involved of some kind, as well as, again, it had to have more enlightened people. The reason why Sulzbach became the center of um, low-cost Jewish printing was because the Duke, at one point in time, was very interested in Hebrew scholarship, and so he encouraged the Hebrew press there. And then, as uh, someone was asking me earlier, um, uh, um, there's a lot of objection by the towns next door, next countries, that they were under uh, undermining the, the other people's printing markets. So the Prague market um, uh, got, um, dem- uh, was, um, couldn't, support, couldn't support the printing press because the results of people were just checking them out right and left and not very good additions. Please. So, so this, what you're talking about here are Italian, most examples I gave you were Italian, are Italian examples, just because I have to, we have more of them. And somehow, the, so this is not, uh, I guess I'm wondering out of what office of the church did this censorship come? Um, there it didn't is, come from something like uh, Inquisition. Yes, it did, although initially it starts, starts with the Council, as early as the Council of Trent. Um, but often the 13. 50-something, 1370. Uh, um, It's very localized. So how big is your political control? How big, you know, know, um, uh, you know, the Pope in Rome may say, we're going to ban Jews from all from Christendom. And the Venetian merchant, you know, union uh, council, uh, better, better, you know, better Venetian marketing um, uh, department says, you know, listen, we've got some really important people here who are financing our activities, or whose cousin is in um, Constantinople or whatever else. Thank you very much. That's not so important to us. And besides, you know, I've got to print the books and take a tax. So it's going on in lots of different ways. So it goes, there, it's both, usually it is, it is, it's going to be imposed on the political slash religious boundaries level. And it's going up and down. So the same book may be censored three or four times over the course of 100, 100 years. The Inquisition did have a list of banned Jewish books, and those who really weren't supposed to have it all, they would collect those. We were not allowed to have those. Okay, let's go. I just couldn't help thinking about the Merchant of Venice, and we were talking about that, the huge, you know, printing movement that happened in Venice, and um, and the, the compromises that yes. were constantly being by Jews in Venice. Indeed. Indeed. Please. So, I like this last page because it shows that someone was really thinking about what it was like to call other people bad names. Yes. And, um, and I came here today because I have a stack of McGuffins. 
and for the last year they were sand in my truck because I've been trying to decide whether I should drop them off at Solid's so that people could use them. Even though I don't particularly like what they, what, uh, what they say was uh, rained down upon uh, the average Egyptian. Indeed. So, so I, I was hoping to find some guidance as to whether, whether, whether members of the religion have, have a right to not necessarily censor, but, but change some of the story as we pass it on. Well, that's a good, let's just say, you know, um, that's more of a rabbinic question than I'm just a scholar here today. Um, uh, but I'll just point out that there's the very famous story about that section of Haggadah, that many Haggadahs of the prince, either in the text or in the margin, in which the um, uh, Israelites are crossing the sea and all the angels in heaven want to start, you know, have a, have a celebration. And God says, shut up, you guys, you should not, this is not a happy moment. Um, my children are drowning. And there's, there is within the tradition counter to what sometimes to us seems a, a narrow way of doing. Well. Um, I'm curious whether there's any indication from kind of a read of the, the text and how they changed over time, whether the people who were praying with it preferred the edited version or preferred the unedited version. Like, I mean, some of the changes that you showed are changes that we want to make to the text today. And there's what, like, what we think of, like, not just our thinking. I'm curious whether, like, we you know when that shift, when this came to be believed as opposed to just forced off the page? It, we, okay, so, you know, two things go on here. This all stuff. One is, of course, we talked to us today about the Ashkenazic rites, um, uh, just for those examples I happen to have. And then we also saw some of the Eretz Israel, the Palestinian rites. Um, uh, we didn't stop there, we had a couple of Italian rites and French rite paragraphs, but the most important rite is what we call I remember right. Okay, so part of it is what I grew up with. Right? Should we stand or sit down for the Shema? Is now a point of controversy, you know, just anxiety in our community, my community right now, in my synagogue, because some people grow up one way and we're suggesting to do it a different way. That's one part of the conversation. Another part is, oh, I want to make sure I'm doing the right right. So, oh, I learned that this is not how Rabbi, so how did Rabbi so-and-so, my teacher, do it, what's passed on, but that's hard to tell if I discover that Rabbi so-and-so's book also passed through censorship on its way from him down to me. Um, as early as the mid-19th century, especially as Jews start trying to integrate into Western Europe and become more modern, and they start to care more what the neighbors say, they opt affirmatively and say it's preferable in this correct language. So it starts really at 1800 in that first part, um, uh, um, uh, for example, the first one of the first English prayer books spread in London um, uh, replaces the "didn't make me a Gentile" with "who made me of this particular people," uh, which is the translation in King James of Exodus um, chapter 19, where God says, "Give to me a nation of priests, a particular people." Uh, I just want last thing I want to say is that if you don't have a copy and want to read the whole thing and learn all about it in the Three Blessings, um, available at your local synagogue, Give Shah Congregation Bethel, um, or today available on Prime.